Hello and welcome to this virtual Night at the Museum event organised by Highgate School in North London. My name is David Smith and after many years of teaching physics at Highgate, I retired in 2014 and now work part-time in the archive. As many of you will know, Cuffing Williams taught at Highgate from 1944 to 1973 when he moved back to Anglesey. Since 2009, we have been organising an annual lecture in his honour at the school. Up until now, they mostly took place in the school's mill centre, highlighted on this aerial photograph of Highgate Village and the school. And here is a picture of the mill centre in the snow that fell a few days before the talk. Last year, we changed the venue for the talks to the school museum, just across the road from the main school site. You can just see the building on the right of this photo, taken at about the same time. It used to be a non-conformist chapel and is a welcoming and intimate space. That is where this talk would have taken place, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic, our speaker, Professor Derry Thomas, and I are both a long way from London, a few miles apart from each other in North Wales. Brought up in Cardiff, Derry Thomas studied natural sciences at Cambridge and stayed to complete a PhD in plant biochemistry. He spent the majority of his career at Bangor University, becoming a professor of biochemistry until his retirement in 2016. Along the way, he undertook visiting fellowships in Australia, America and Germany, and has some 120 academic publications to his name. Darius had a career-long interest in the popularisation of science through the medium of Welsh, via broadcasts, lectures and articles. In recognition of his efforts, he was awarded the National Eisteddfod's Science and Technology Medal in 2017. Thank you so much, Derry, for having accepted our invitation to give the 13th Highgate Cuffing Williams Lecture. We are very much looking forward to learning more, probably a lot more, about colour. Good evening to you all, and thank you, David, for that warm introduction. Uh, and thank you especially for the opportunity to talk to the Highgate audience this evening. And thank you for that trip around the museum. Um, I really am looking forward to one day visiting it in body as well as in spirit as we're doing this evening. Well, it really is a privilege to contribute to the memory of your auspicious art master, Sir Cuffin Williams. He was no question about it. He was very warmly thought of in Wales, very highly regarded, a real genuine national treasure in the true meaning of the word. Well, I want to start uh, my talk this evening with another Welsh artist, William Ruse, a 19th century uh, portraitist, uh, largely, uh, who had an exhibition in Oriel Morn in Llangevni uh, in the summer of 2020. And I have a particular interest in the work of William Ruse, so I went to visit this. But tucked away Behind uh, the, the exhibition of William Ruse in the same room was part of the permanent exhibition of Cuffin Williams, and it's this delightful collection. His easel, uh, examples of his work on the wall, and this remarkable table, strewn with the paraphernalia of an artist from his workshop, and it's been recreated here in the corner of Oriel Morn as a permanent part of the exhibition. Now, one of the comments that's often made about Cuffin Williams's work is that he used a limited colour palette. And here's a quotation from the web, including the spelling, a limited palette consisting of grey and subtle green. Now, in many ways, it's difficult to argue with this. And here is an example of his work. It's the painting of the farm at Blyne and Nant in Nant Francon, and it certainly has grey and subtle green in it. Now, it happens that I'm very familiar with Blyne and Ant. I, in fact, live at the other end of the same valley. I'm about five miles north of Blyne and Ant, as I'm speaking to you now. And if I looked out of the window here, I would see the same grey and subtle green. And if I went up to the top of Nantfracon, I'd be very surprised to see colours other than these. These are the natural colours, the colours I'd expect to see of that area um, from a painting. So if that's limited colour, what would be an unlimited palette? Well, here are some biological examples, familiar biological examples, the blue of the peacock, the yellow, the orange of this lovely delectable fruit we have in the corner, uh, and these 
colours of that we give as, as, as presents to people are flowers. Here they are uh, in the wonderful Chennai flower market in India. Uh, these are, no question about it, unlimited colours uh, that can be used um, uh, to describe the world around us. But if we return to Cuffin's table, and I'm indebted, indebted to Ian Jones of Oriel Mond for this photograph, he's taken a selection of that uh, mass of old um, tubes of paint. But what do we have here? We have cadmium orange that would be lovely to paint the fruit in the market we saw earlier there's some lemon yellow here which would be very happy in a, in, in a painting of flowers and here we have french ultramarine i would have thought it'd be perfectly good in painting uh, any self-respecting peacock so the colors we have here certainly don't appear to be limited uh, what's what's going on and that's going to be the topic of most of my talk as we carry on but there is another aspect that I would like to mention. I'm a biochemist. I'm interested in biology. I'm interested in uh, human physiology, amongst other things. And this regards the fact that Kevin Williams, for most of his life, suffered from epilepsy. Now, uh, he started off uh, an army career. He set his heart on joining the army. But at the St. David's Day dinner in Menai Bridge, between, in fact, where I am here now and David uh, is sitting. Um, at the St. David's Day dinner in 1937, at the age of 19, immediately after the dinner, a Cuffin suffered his first epileptic seizure. He describes it very vividly in his autobiographies. It, of course, was a life-changing event, and it certainly meant that he could no longer follow the career he wanted in the army, but it opened a career in art school for him. And, of course, from art school, it led to Highgate School, and if it weren't for that, we wouldn't be talking about him this evening. So, the question of Caffin's epilepsy, I think, is worth, is worth a mention. Now, when Caffin was a youngster, there were, there were treatments for epilepsy, uh, and the, the medication available were things like treating with bromide or with barbiturates. They've been available since the beginning of the 20th century. But the time when Caffin gets involved with this sort of medication, a new generation of medication was becoming available. In 1940, phen phenytoin, for example, became available. Um, then in the 1950s, carbamazepine. Uh, I was familiar with carbamazepine. My own father took that towards the end of his life. Uh, and then slightly later, valproate. Now, I'm not sure which of these medications uh, would have been prescribed for Cuffin Williams, um, but there are various questions about them which are relevant here. To start with, does epilepsy itself influence perception? Was this having an effect on him? Well, I've heard several anecdotes um, that refer to this matter of the aura uh, that people who are in the process of having an epileptic seizure have a heightened level of perception before the, the, the seizure itself. And I've heard one story from a friend of mine whose father, uh, the judge Dewey Watkin Powell, once spent a, a train journey with Cuffin coming back to North Wales from London. And Cuffin described to Dewey um, the feeling he had a couple of days before uh, an epileptic seizure appeared on him, that he did have this feeling of, of uh, more sensitive perception, and he would consciously go to areas he wished to paint and take notes, which he would then subsequently translate into his paintings. So it appears that uh, the epilepsy did have an influence on Cuffin's, um, on Cuffin's perception. How about his color perception, however? And this is what, what, what is raised when people talk about his limited palate. And can the medication that he was uh, prescribed, might this have had an effect? And I want to return to this towards the end of my talk. 
However, my brother-in-law, uh, who happens to be one of the young artists that Cuffin was very kind to help at the beginning of his career, um, Gareth Parry, assures me that there were f very few artists who had a better concept of colour and a better handling of colour than Cuffin. So I would start off by saying that the limited palette certainly doesn't seem to be due to any problem that Cuffin had with regard to perceiving colour per se. So what are colours? Well, we can go back to Aristotle in the 4th century BC to have people beginning to discuss colour scientifically. Um, but it's Isaac Newton who really begins to describe colour and how, it's, or how they're perceived and light and how it's perceived in a scientific fashion. Uh, in the middle part of the 17th century, in fact, Isaac Newton's first great discovery was the fact that he could split light using a prism from the white light of the sun to generate the colours of the rainbow. And equally crucially, he could do the reverse. He could bring the colours together again and regenerate white light. And here, in fact, is the spectrum that we're familiar with. The very word spectrum in this context was introduced by Newton in 1672. And here are the colours. Now, when I was in school, I learned physics in English. So I learned the word Roy G. Biv as an acronym for the colours. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Now, interestingly, the seven colours of the rainbow were actually introduced by Newton himself. Prior to this, in the English-speaking world, they tended to refer to six colours. And it was Newton who introduced indigo uh, to make up the seventh colour, probably to match the concept of seven notes in a musical octave. There was a great deal of interest about the science of music around about this time, so that colours matched the sevenness of the octave, we in fact end up with seven colours, and indigo was the extra one that Newton added. We're not quite sure what he actually meant by indigo, but that's, that's neither here or there. Some of you might have learned another acronym. Richard of York gave battle in vain. And just for the record, here's that as well, Richard of York's head, which was relatively recently discovered or rediscovered in, in Leicester. Now, the concept of light and what light is has to be one of the great discussions of physics over the last 300 years. For Newton, he was quite happy thinking them as, as being particles emanating from the sun and bouncing around rather like bullets or billiard balls, ultimately finding their way into our eyes and where we could see them. But during the 19th century, especially the work of James Clerk Maxwell, the Scottish physicist and mathematician, looked at this concept of light in a much larger background concept. And he came up with the idea of electromagnetic radiation that included not only visible light, um, the light of, of, of Newton, but also infrared light and ultraviolet that were known, had been discovered the previous century. Um, but he then proposed that there was a whole spectrum that extended beyond these even and this was confirmed some years later by the German Heinrich Rudolf Hertz, who worked on longer wavelengths of light and demonstrated the existence of radio waves. Towards the end of that century and the beginning of the, of the 20th century, X-rays and gamma rays were added then to, the, um, to this electromagnetic radiation spectrum, of which light is a part. Now, they argued... Clark, Maxwell, and Hertz, that light were composed, white light is composed of waves rather than particles. Now, it was the 20th century that brought these, brought these two concepts together with a quantum theory that, in fact, light is both a particle and a wave at the same time. I'm not going to follow that argument any further this evening. Because what I want to spend most of our time discussing is how humans see color. How did Cuffin Williams see colour and how did he then represent that for the rest of us to be able to see colour?
Now, as a biochemist, I've always been interested in the specific molecules involved in processes such as this. And here we have a picture of the one molecule that starts off the whole process. It's called retina because it's found in the retina. That's hardly surprising. But what is surprising is that it's the same single retinal molecule that is found in all animals of all types, shapes, and forms, and as far as we know, has been so for the last 400 to 500 million years. With the whole biodiversity of the animal world, it's just one molecule that re receives the photon of light and starts the process that leads to you seeing me here at the moment, for example. If you're not familiar with chemical notation, here is a diagram of retinal. The corners and the ends of the lines here are carbon atoms. The lines between them is the, are the glue that holds the, the atoms together to form a molecule, uh, and they are composed of electrons. I've drawn retinal here in what's called the cis form. This means that it's uh, at the 11, carbon number 11, there's a bend involved with it. So this is cis retinal. This is vitamin A, by the way. Well, when light comes along and a photon of light hits this molecule, uh, there's a dramatic physical rearrangement at that carbon 11. Exactly like a switch, the molecule changes its shape. When I lecture to students on biochemistry, I use this as an example. All the students are familiar with turning a light on by activating a switch. Well, here we have a nanos, nanometer, nanoscale um, switch that it turns, and that is the first step in the process that ends up in our, in our seeing things. Well, vitamin A, you will know uh, a source of vitamin A is carrots beta carotene from carrots. Uh, and here is a picture of the lovely carotene molecule. I love the shapes of these molecules. Now, this molecule is, the, is, is responsible for the orange color of carrots. Um, but it's also, there's a reaction that splits it in half to form two identical molecules, both of which are retinal. So that is the origin of vitamin A. And that's why when we eat carrots, um, the molecule ends up so to speak, in our eyes. But there's a lovely anecdote here. During the Second World War, um, just after the, the Battle of Britain, uh, the RAF managed to reduce the size of radar sets sufficiently small that they could be put into the aircraft. So airborne radar was a very important part in the success of the RAF fighting at night in the night fighters against the Luftwaffe. Now, in order to try and prevent the, the Luftwaffe from knowing that the RAF had this technology, they created the story that the pilots of the RAF were being fed lots of carrots, and this allowed them to see in the dark. Now, till today, parents tell their kids, you must eat carrots so you'll be able to see in the dark better. Well, I'm afraid to say it was fake news at the time, and it's still fake. Um, fake news isn't anything new, but here's a lovely one uh, that has been in circulation since the 1940s. Well, there are many colors. We've seen at least seven in the rainbow. How can one molecule be responsible for absorbing all these different colors? And I want to briefly go through this. And I want to do it by introducing one of my favorite molecules. This to me is the most elegant of molecules. It's called lycopene. It's a stainless steel needle of a nice straight molecule alternating single and double bonds as they're called. It's called lycopene because it comes from lycopersicum, the tomato, and it is the red color in tomato. So it's a magnificent molecule and a magnificent color. I should say, of course, that it's red because it itself absorbs all the other colors of the spectrum. It doesn't absorb red, um, and therefore we see red reflected off this molecule. Um, it's a reflection we're seeing, not any synthesis of color uh, from lycopene itself. So a lovely molecule. Here's another of my favorite molecules. Again, a wonderful shape, but also such a wonderful name. 
Esh Holt Zanthin. When I first saw it, I thought this has to be a ne Mexican Nahuatl name, all those Zs and Xs together. And it's, the, and it's, it's extracted from the Californian poppy, that's also American. Um, and it's, it's in fact the yellow color of the Californian poppy. I was a little bit disappointed when I realized, of course, it's named after the poppy itself, which is called Esh Holtzia, um, which in itself was named after the the botanist who discovered and first described the Californian poppy. I'll leave the German speakers amongst you to work out what the origin of his name was, because even that has an interesting botanical con uh, connotation. But here now is a yellow color. Um, we've seen red, we've seen yellow. Here's another red color. In fact, the capsaicin color of the red pepper is another example of this. Now, I use this molecule to explain quite a sophisticated aspect of advanced chemistries to my students. These alternating double single double pi bonds, as they call them, uh, have a very special property, which was described uh, by the great 20th century scientist, the 20th century chemist Erwin Schrödinger. He who invented the cat that was both alive and dead at the same time, which of course is a quantum phenomenon, and it was described the quanta behavior of such molecules as this um, that allowed Schrodinger to describe to us the shapes of these molecules. But the important aspect of this particular molecule is that these alternating double bonds allow the electrons, rather than just being stuck between two individual atoms, the individual electrons of this molecule can whiz from one end of the molecule back and forth um, in some kind of um, infernal racetrack. Uh, it's described as particle is in a box, and it's the that the length of their, of their freedom that determines the wavelength at which light they're going to absorb. Now, we can consider a, a, a musical analogy to this. I don't know how often you sing to your piano, but here's a lovely um, uh, grand piano, and I can assure you, if you were to stand to one side of this and sing a note as loudly as you could, the piano will sing back to you. It'll sing the same note. Your voice sets up resonance in a particular string and it starts vibrating and then of course you can hear it. Different strings are very vibrate at different notes. That's why you have the keyboard to play them individually. Well, the same now is true for our molecules. So lycopene is red with a little bit of distortion on the end ends, a little bit of chemical reaction. Um, life makes a red molecule into a yellow molecule. So you can imagine a grand piano made of all these individual molecules, and they could then give you a whole range of different wavelengths. But I've told you that retinal on its own does this. And what's even more peculiar is that retinal itself actually absorbs in the ultraviolet. So we, in fact, we wouldn't be able to see anything from it if that was the entire story. Now, in addition to changing the shape or the length or the weight of the strings in the grand piano, another way to change the note is to tune them with a tuning uh, handle, as in this case. So by distorting the strings, we can change the note. Well, what distorts the, the retinal molecule in our retinae? Well, it's a protein. A large protein molecule in the membranes of the cells that we see with uh, the, the, uh, the retinal is this red part of the molecule here, and the rest of this is the protein. It's called the opsin protein. Biochemists very often call their chemicals after where they find them, so no prizes for guessing where opsin comes from. And it's not the different retinals that give the different color, it's the different opsins. Uh, and it's a range of individual proteins, therefore, that allow us to have different colors. And these have evolved over 400 million years. We know that animals have used opsins for that period of time, and that's the basis of my saying that therefore this system with the retinal has been around for that long. Human evolution has had its own role to play in this for over the last 30 million years or so, and I'll come on to that towards the end of the talk. Now, when I refer to Newton, I refer to the colors of the rainbow, a spectrum. 
Um, and one consider if we ha one had light of a single wavelength, a single slice of that spectrum, it would have the color of that spectrum. So, for example, here, um, be about, around about 590 nanometers happens to be the wavelength. It would be orange. Now, if we had light at that wavelength, it would be orange. Now, you're familiar, I think, most of you with an example of this in the old days uh, when I used to wander the streets of Cardiff. The world in the evening was orange because all the lamps were sodium lamps because sodium, when it's heated up, emits light at a, a, largely at a single wavelength, which is orange. Now, that is a monochromatic light. Neon, on the other hand, another series of lights. Neon, when you heat up neon, um, it has a whole range of different colors, and those different colors have been used uh, by lighting technologies to generate the wide range of colors that we have with neon. So neon, therefore, is a mixture of colors. And by playing with those colors, we can generate not only that, we can generate a range, range of different colors. So we can imagine that neon is a polychrome color, uh, whereas sodium is a monochrome color. Now, children are quite happy with this concept. Uh, they can take uh, two monochrome colors, such as yellow uh, and blue, and mix them together, and they appear to produce another monochrome color, which is green. But in fact, we know instinctively that that green is, in fact, a mixture of yellow and blue. So something strange is going on here. We seem to be able to generate another color from mixing two existing colors. Now, Newton could show this with his light. Um, didn't well use paint as well, presumably, but light is was simpler for him to do experimentally. He could paint a top, a spinning top with the colors of the rainbow, and then by spinning that, all the colors merged together, which in our eyes gave the impression of white, that they all came together to give a white light. So empirical ex experimentation showed this relationship between the colors and also came up with the concept of primary colors, which I'll develop in a moment. It so happens that when you add paints, you end up with black. If you add colors, you end up with white. One is subtractive, one is additive. I'll leave you to worry about that dilemma. But the question is, when we mix light together and we get white, what therefore is white light? It would appear to be everything mixed together. Well, in some ways, we owe white light to the sun. This is our uh, source. It was the source of Newton's color, for example. Uh, so one might imagine it to be white. And yet, if we ask a child to paint the sun, they will paint it yellow. Is the sun yellow? No, the, the sun is definitely white. And you can prove this to yourself by holding a white sheet of paper up on a sunny day, and it isn't yellow as it would be if you had a yellow light shining on it. Uh, this is white light giving a white sheet of paper. So the sun is white, as we'd imagine. And it's our reference for white. Now, the scientists of the 19th century try to analyze this carefully, and we now have Ludwig Boltzmann to thank for this description of what the color of the sun is. Here we have a range of wavelengths and their specific intensity, and there seems to be a relationship with the maximum intensity in the yellow, which is why maybe children seem to think it's yellow, but there are also then varying amounts of different colors, and mixed together, that gives us what we call white. Now, what Boltzmann realized that this color distribution, which also involved infrared and ultraviolet, which we can't see, was due to the temperature of the sun. The surface of the sun is 6,000 Kelvin, approximately, uh, 6,000 degrees centigrade. If we have different light sources, so a, a lamp filament, old-fashioned um, tungsten lamp, has a temperature of about 3,000, this has a different distribution with a different color mix. Uh, a car an arc lamp is somewhere in between them. Now, the Iron Age blacksmiths knew uh, this relationship between this color, it's called black body radiation, um, or the Boltzmann distribution, um, and that by looking at the color of the iron as it came out of their forge when they were trying to forge it, they could tell by the color what temperature was at. 
coolish hot iron is red as it gets hotter it becomes whiter and whiter this is the temperature on this graph 1200 if you can read a degree centigrade a blacksmith can get up to about 2000 by which time of course the, the iron is white hot but an astronomer, astronomer can go further stars that are of about 6000 degrees like our sun are indeed white but as we push this spectrum further and further into the ultraviolet very hot stars are blue so here we have the spectrum that an astronomer uses to tell the temperature of the sun so here we have um, a mixture of colors all giving us a color which we are familiar with in a sense uh, as white when it comes with a specific temperature so that's all white then <clears throat> well I've shown you the picture of the that, that the tungsten light the, the, the hot the hot bulb um, that has the distribution of the black body radiation here so that gives us this kind of white um, a modern LED lamp if you go to the shop, you can buy various kinds of LED. Here's a white LED. You can buy a pure white one, or you can buy a warm white one. Now, they look pretty much like this spectrum, but there clearly is a difference because engineered into this spectrum is this blue contribution as well. So it seems to be that, well, maybe all white isn't quite the same because these LED whites are a little bit different from the tungsten white. But if we use an old-fashioned, um, well, relatively old-fashioned fluorescent light, things get even more complicated. So here we have a fluorescent lamp and the spectra of a, a pure white one or a cool white one and a warm white one. Well, the actual color spectra are now quite different. And yet we perceive these all as being the same colors. So we have the same perception, but a different color. Um, that we that, 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 that's generating that. Now it turns out that we don't need all the colors. The solution to this dilemma is how we perceive the same color from different colors is that we don't actually use them all. And for that we can thank this polymath uh, from the end of the 18th century, um, Thomas Young. Um, the, the, uh, a recent biography of his came out, um, written by Andrew Robinson, published in Penguin in 2007, and I'll read what's on the cover. Thomas Young, the anonymous polymath who proved Newton wrong, explained how we see, which is what we talk about now, cured the sick, and deciphered the Rosetta Stone. You may be familiar with that story, amongst other feats of genius. So here we have Thomas Young, um, one of the great uh, physicists, well, the great polymaths uh, of, of his era. Now, he argued that there were just three sensors, three sensing systems in our eyes, and the signals from those three colors um, generated all the other colors. Now, this is a modern version of um, Thomas Young's colors, and they are the three senses of the human eye. So this color system is totally anthropocentric. We'll come back to other animals later on. So we have at the blue end of the spectrum, the short wavelength, the S uh, sensor. In the middle range, the green, um, we have a middle range M sensor. And then at the red end, we have a longer wavelength, which is called the L. So S, M, and L are the three color sensing systems uh, that Young predicted would occur in the human eye. Well, I want to take a short commercial break at this stage, um, meaning I want to go into the current world of commerce to do with colors, because we, modern commerce requires definitions of color, not just the monochrome colors. The monochrome colors are quite straightforward, but in cinema, in computer games, what you're looking at me now tonight on your screen, fashion, all these demand very carefully controlled color uh, conventions. Now, 
Um, here's a lovely picture of a, a recreated cinema in Downers Grove in Chicago, Illinois. They've been entertaining people since 1921. And this takes us back to that period. In 1913, a little bit before then, the Commission Internationale de Eclairage, the CIE, was established. And in 1928, they took great interest in two experiments on human beings that were run. The experiments, one of them on only 10 people out of the entire population of the world, the other on seven people. And the question was, would those 10 and 7 individuals agree on which mixture of monochrome colors produced any polychrome color? Now, quite remarkably, they did. Um, it was quite unexpected in a sense, but to a high degree of, of, of accuracy, um, all 17 people agreed. And this led to the CIE developing what's called the color space. Now, there are three different colors they chose. In fact, they went, they followed young and used red, green, and blue. They happened to have a very good source of green and blue light through two different wavelengths of a mercury uh, lamp, rather like the sodium lamp I mentioned earlier. Red was a little bit more of a problem, but it turned out it wasn't so important. So they had a good red source as well. Now, to generate all the colors from those three, you could imagine having a three-dimensional graph. It has to have a blue axis, a red axis, and a green axis. So imagine the f end of that cube, the far end is black, and the, the corner that's sort of missing here would would be white. So there now are all our colors. That seems to solve the problem of definition. But there's a bit of a difficulty here. What we're seeing here is are the hues of the colors. They're their color, if you wish, their chromaticity. There's no concept of how bright those colors are. So we also need a concept of luminance. Well, it's a bit difficult to put um, on in a picture an extra dimension. So the mathematicians went at it and converted these three axes into two axes. Um, those of you who are familiar with, with mathematics, it's equivalent to a linear regression where you can make three-dimensional things one-dimensional less. They did that. So they ended up with a two-dimensional graph, which includes all the colors that are available. The white crosses are the three colors that the CIE used. So everything within the triangle of the three colors is now the color space of the CIE 1931 XY, which is what that was described as. Now, there are more modern versions of this. So, for example, because of its great importance in computing, Hewlett-Packard and Microsoft in 1996 generated their own version based on exactly the same principle. It's called the sRGB triangle. So within this triangle are all the colors that they use. Now, there are a couple of interesting points here that I don't want to spend too much time over, but to draw your attention. The edge of this curve is, in fact, the, the Roy G. Biv. Those are the colors of, the, spe of the, the, the rainbow, but they're not actually included in the sRGB color space. And this large patch here, the camel's hump, if you wish, between green and blue, uh, indigo and violet, those weren't included in, in the color scheme of the CIE. If you're puzzled by this line here and you've often wondered what are the colors between red and violet, well, here they are, the purples and the pinks. Um, so those, again, come out of this, of this uh, graph. All the colors here are described as the gamut, another word that was borrowed from the musical description of all the notes in a piece of music. So the gamut of colors are here. Now, in the center of that diagram, you can possibly see a line. This is our blacksmith's um, black body line. And in the middle of it, um, 6,000 degrees, is what we call the white point. As you might imagine, that's where all the co colors balance out. Now, to give you some idea of what the extra dimension, the one coming out of the, the graph, is showing you, there we have our 50 shades of gray. Gray, after all, is merely a different lumin luminance of white. So in the vertical version here, we'd have all the shades of gray and we'd have all the shades of luminance of all the other colors um, at all the other points here as well.
Now, within this two-dimensional space here, a typical human can distinguish some six to ten million different hues, different chromicities. So that is the sensitivity of the human eye. There are other systems, not just the CIE, that are used in commerce as the RAL system um, and also a natural color system, which is based not so much on the basic physics, which is what we've just seen there, but based more on the anthropocentric response of the human eye and brain to the colors. But the concepts are very similar to the ones of the CIE. If we return now to a second to, or at last now, to the, the human uh, color perception idea, the tri trichromicity, as it's called, of Thomas Young, um, there are several very interesting points come out of this. One of which is that different colors, different mixtures of colors, can give us exactly the same perceived result. Um, rather like the different mixtures of white all responded to white in our case. Now, I've taken these pictures from the graph. They're diagrammatic rather than very precise. But here we have the three color sensors available, um, the, 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 the blue, the green, and the red. Now, each of these is sending just a comp one unified signal to the brain. So those two line, the two arrows I've got on the right and left shoulder of the blue, wavelengths very different from each other. If the eye would sense each of those, they would send the identical signal to the brain. Now, what this means is that if we have a range, therefore, a spectrum that is symmetrical around the center here, each of these spectra at that point would produce the same color in the brain. And we can do the same for the other two, which each of these three spectra, therefore, actually would give us the same response, the same perception. And this is called metamerism. Different colors, same perception. Um, now, it's all very well. Um, to say that, but there's an extra element in what we see with color. We see generally reflected color in the case of paint, in the case of cuffin, which is not only the colors that are reflected by the paint itself, but of course what light was shone on the light in the first place. So this can become a difficult problem when, when objects are viewed under different illumination. In this picture here, I hope you can see uh, the paint job, the spray, um, um, under different lighting conditions, it matches and it doesn't match. In the old days, when you bought a new tie in a shop, you went to the door so that it was in sunlight to make sure it was the same color and match your suit and your shirt uh, from the color under the lights inside the shop. So this are examples now of metamerism. Now, relatively recently, some six years ago, a kind of anti-metamerism story appeared uh, in the, the, the social media, and it became, it was christened, The Dress. Um, in February 2015, there was a wedding in the island of Colonsay in the Hebrides, uh, and one of the ladies involved was very proud of the new frock that she'd brought, the new wedding dress or the dress for the wedding, and she took a photograph of it and put that photograph on social media. Now, it so happened that the photograph miscolored it a little bit, but that's irrelevant because this is the image that went round the world on social media. And within hours, there was a remarkable response. And later, when it was possible to sort of uh, think about what the science of that response was, it was discovered that 57% of people who see this image see it as a black and blue dress. 30% see it as white and gold. I won't tell you what I'm seeing it at the moment. I'll leave you to decide. 10% of people who saw it could switch from one to the other. Now, we're not talking about different screens. Two individuals are looking at the same screen would be seeing them in different ways. So here we have the same color, but a different perception. Something interesting is going on in the brain. Now, this particular story was nothing at all to do with the 
production of the color on the computer screen or the phone screen or whatever it is it is actually to do with the deeper processes of the way that the brain processes color and at the moment we don't have an explanation for this particular phenomenon so read this space as far as the dress is concerned we still don't know the story well We've had a fairly complicated description there, but is it universal to all animals? Do all animals have all animals for the last 400 million years seen in the same way? Well, of course, I'm referring here to Darwin's idea of evolution. Has there been an evolution of visual color? And the answer is there has definitely been evolution because it is not a universal system. And what we see is an evolutionary compromise that characterizes us specifically as humans. It is an anthropocentric process. Now these are the three absorbances that Young described. We now know that they're due to three different proteins, three different opsins, uh, and they have the wavelengths that we've described before. I keep bees. And I'm always fascinated by the descriptions that bees can see in the ultraviolet. Some flowers have symbols on them that allow the bees to find the nectar. And they're invisible to us, but they're visible to bees because they can see in the ultraviolet. They have a sensor down below um, the, the a shorter wavelength than we have. They also see in the blue. They have then a single sensor um, at the upper range of the spectrum. Hummingbirds have four, so they are not trichromic, they are now tetrachromic and see the world with a combination of four different colors that have to be integrated. And uh, that's quite dramatic. But as far as the birds are concerned, well, penguins, you might imagine that penguins living in a white environment aren't particularly interested in color, but in order to distinguish different colors at the blue, blue end of the spectrum, they in fact have yet another um, uh, opsin. They have five altogether. So humans with three seem fairly mediocre, but there's a group of humans that actually have four. They're all women. And for some time, it's been thought that maybe some women had a fourth opsin. It's possible to show it, but it was not sure whether it was functional tetrachromicity or, or not. Now, in 2010, uh, a scientific paper was written describing this lady. She's an artist from San Diego in California. Her name is Conchetta Antico, and she is the first proven functional tetrachromic human. It's probable that about 6% of women actually have a fourth uh, opsin and can, as a result, see thousands more colors than we men do. Not talking about color blindness. I'll come back to that in a moment. So over evolutionary history, we have a whole range of different situations. Um, I haven't mentioned black and white vision. This is a different part of the retina, the, 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 um, the, the, the rod part of the retina. So there is a black-white um, color system as well. So the simplest system with one color opsin, it would be called monochromic, between that one protein and the black-white, these can make out about 200 colors. There's one single nocturnal monkey, apparently the owl monkey. It only has one opsin and can only make out some 200 colors. Marine mammals, um, they also have a very limited color gamut in their color space. Most terrestrial non-primate mammals uh, can see two. So all these stories of bulls and dogs, etc., um, they seem to have two. Um, humans, as I say, have three. Uh, most great apes, our old world chim chimpanzees and gorillas, say, see three. Marsupials see three. Um, reptiles, amphibians, and birds on the whole see four. Insects as well. Um, and this is a kind of diagram I've made up that these opsins have appeared and disappeared through time. The human story is quite interesting. Some 40 million years ago, our ape, early ape ancestors only had two opsins. Some 30 million years ago, one of those split to give us the M and the L, which gives us now our three. In the case of Conchetta, um, 
either in her or in her mother, presumably, um, a mutation occurred where uh, a bit of the gene for the L uh, L uh, opsin and a bit of the gene for the M opsin um, were duplicated and got stuck together so that in addition to the S, M and L, uh, Conchetta also has a hybrid that is sort of halfway between the M and the L and that then is her fourth uh, colour that she can see. Well, I briefly mentioned colour blindness in, uh, a few moments ago. I don't like the term colour blindness. It, it, it gives the impression that somebody is, is, is lacking in something. Well, that's not totally true, because in many cases, colour blindness isn't due to lacking one of these opsins. It's just that a small mutation in one of them has moved the maximum of absorbance somehow, so that the way that the colour mixes um, are sensed are slightly different. In some cases, however, yes, one of the opsins is, or one or more of the opsins is totally missing, in which case um, then that's a, a different form of, of, of um, color blindness altogether. Now, bringing color blindness into the story uh, and this concept of animals seeing different seeing the world in different ways brings us to the lovely story of the squirrel monkey that lives in South America. Now the male squirrel monkey, like most American monkeys, only sees two colors. They only have two opsins. The L opsin is absent, so they're equivalent to the red-green um, de deuteranopia uh, color blindness. And here's a picture of a male squirrel monkey in a paper published in 2009 doing a color vision test. Well, the female squirrel monkey, however, does have three. So here's the image um, in three colors that the female would see. Here is the colors that the male would see. Now, all of you listening are now experts in molecular biology. Over this last year, I'm speaking now in February 2021, we'll know all about the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccination, which introduces genes for a part of the viral spike protein into humans so that our bodies can respond to the presence of this novel protein. Well, it's possible to use exactly the same technique using a, 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 a safe virus to introduce, to inject into the eyes of the male monkeys. And for a couple of months, that injection allows them to also generate this extra protein. And when those monkeys then do the color tests, they behave in exactly the same as the female monkeys. It's been discussed that this may be a way of treating color blindness, if that's a problem for people, um, by reintroducing these genes in a transient way. So there's a use of the AstraZeneca COVID technique um, before uh, it was used as, as a vaccine. Well, if we think that Conchetta and the penguins are special, the star of the show, as far as I'm concerned, is this creature. It's the mantis shrimp. It lives off the coast of Australia. It's called a stomatopod. And this beastie sees not only visible light, infrared, ultraviolet, it can see other forms of color as well. It has 12 regular color analysis systems at different wavelengths, um, six of them in the ultraviolet. It's rather clever, in fact. It manages those six with only two opsins and then wears different tinted spectacles to allow those to split into more different colors. But in addition to that, it can see what's called polarized light. Now, if you've been to a 3D cinema over the last few years, you'll know you put these special spectacles on and they're polarizing spectacles. Some of you have polarizing uh, anti-glare spectacles, sun sunglasses. Now, this is to do with the fact <clears throat> that when light has waves, when it vibrates, most light vibrates in all different dimensions. But that you can have it that all the light, rather like the waves on the surface of a lake, will vibrate in the same direction. Now that's called a plane polarized light. And this diagram here shows that. 
It's also possible to have the polarization rotate as it moves through the cosmos. It can rotate with a, a right hand, hand screw or a left hand screw. Our friend, the stromatopod, can actually see all of these. Not only the colors, it can see pol plain polarized light and also right and left polarized light as well. So this really is a truly remarkable event. We have no concept at all of what the world would look like if we could see it like that, except when we use machines and create artificial versions of it. Well, all of these animals are seeing the world. Now, I want to spend a couple of minutes asking why is the world the color it is? Why does Cuffin use the gamut of colors, um, the color space that he does. Now, to start with, I need to, to say that I lied a little bit in simplifying the story of white. Here now is the black body radiation I mentioned earlier. Uh, so this is our white color, you might imagine. We only see the colors that are colored in this diagram within the range uh, between the ultraviolet and the infrared. Why is this? Well, here is the overall, the same diagram. The yellow is the color of the 6,000 degree Kelvin sun. The red, however, here is the color that reaches the surface of the Earth. The thin layer of the atmosphere protects us, as we think, from some of this radiation. Ozone, the ozone layer, protects us from the ultraviolet. We can see, therefore, in the bottom diagram here that ozone is cutting out most of the ultraviolet that arrived. Carbon dioxide um, absorbs in the infrared, famously so. That's part of the global warming story. But the major greenhouse gas, as it turns out, is actually water. And water absorbs large quantities of light, especially in the infrared, um, that would otherwise reach the surface of the Earth. So in evolutionary terms, there was no purpose for light, for eyes to evolve to see in these wavelengths to which the atmosphere is effectively opaque. So the main light that comes through, in addition to the main light that leaves the sun, is in our Roy G. Biv region. So that, in a nutshell, is why we see, or why we've evolved to see, the colors we do. Well, let's ask another question. We talk about Greenpeace and greening the world. We have a greening revolution at the moment. Industry must become greener. Why green? Why choose green rather than any other color? Well, it's because when you look at nature, here's a picture, I think, of the Amazonian rainforest, then it is quite definitely green. Now, why is it green? This is the sort of question that evolutionary biologists ask, each, ask themselves. And this is one possible solution. Now, green uh, is in the middle of the spectrum. It's close to yellow, and you'll remember that this was the region of the maximum energy coming from the sun, and yet green plants don't seem to use it. And one possible explanation is, is that the earliest photosynthetic bacteria took all the light from that central region. So when green plants, the, the ancestors of modern green plants, started evolving, then they had to use the scraps that were left over. And they used the two ends of the spectrum, um, leaving out the center, so that we have the chlorophyll absorbing in the blue and in the red rather than the middle. And it worked and they haven't bothered to change ever since. So the nature we see is green, possibly because green plants were latecomers in, in the feeding trough. Well, green. Well, David Attenborough will tell us, though, that the planet is blue. So why green and blue? Well, that's green, the green story. The blue story is, in fact, to do with the fact that water absorbs light. And within the visible spectrum, it absorbs red a little bit more than blue. And in fact, it's the oceans that are blue. When we talk about the blue planet looking at the Earth from the moon or from space, it's the it's, a, it's, the, it's the oceans that, that are blue. And this is because the red is absorbed 
and the blue then moves around and and is is reflected um, from from the oceans so again uh, that's an important aspect for the blue aspects of this this is an image that I lecture about to my plant physiology students that illustrates this in a very real way. If you walk on a rocky coast, look in a rock pool, you will notice that the algae that are a little bit under the surface, uh, this is from uh, California, it could equally be from the rocky coast of the Thien Peninsula or uh, the, the Isle of Anglesey that I know Kathin and David, our friend, is um, uh, f f fond of walking. You would see the same phenomenon. The deeper algae are red. Why? Because the water is absorbing some of the red as it's working its way through the water, so it's of less value to them. They're simply reflecting it back. So here we have an example of color differences within the natural world due to this absorbance of um, the red light by the water, which also gives the world its blue color. Well, I want to finish looking a little bit at this question of Cuffin's medication. The concept, does this affect his color palette at all? And this brings us to the last of the science lessons of today. We've got these three pigment systems, uh, the black and white color, no, black, or black and white intensity rather, and then our colors. We have the L, M, and the S. Now, towards the end of the previous century, the 19th century, Evert Herring brought a lot of observations together, partially to do with color blindness, partially to do with after images. If you look at a bright light source that then is taken away, our brains see an opposite color. If we look at bright blue, we see yellow. If we look bright red, we'll see green. And came up with the idea of opponency, that rather than working independently, the three color sensors work in pairs or in a rather lopsided pair. The L and the M, each of them has a signal depending on how much of its light is absorbed and then will send a signal to an immediately uh, adjacent cell which sorts out how much L am I having and how much M am I having and will send on um, a, a red-green axis signal to the brain, the visual cortex. The blue is itself doing a similar thing, but there is a spillover from the red-green, and we would visualize that as being yellow. So it's as if there was a yellow signal as well, which is forming a second ratio, if you wish, between the yellow and the blue signal. And this then is sent on. Uh, this concept, as I said, is called opponents. So we have these two pairs, or two pairs of opponent colors, plus black and white. Now, recently, um, the exact cells in the retina that involved in this process have been identified. Now, there are many laboratories throughout the world, but here's one uh, from uh, Washington University, for example, uh, where they can put microelectrodes, small electrodes, into the cells and measure the activity of the cells uh, and then shine lights of different kinds on them. And they can sort out, they can look at the different um, cells of the, this, these two axes uh, and the way that they're sending their signals on and actually measure the processes involved in this. Now, the name of the department gives you an idea of what sort of goes on there, electrophysiology and optogenetics. This is the cutting edge science uh, that is unpicking uh, the opponency concept of the way that our eyes are working. Now, Cuffin, well, it turns out that uh, phenytoin and the carbamazepine uh, medication that Cuffin was using is known to influence uh, the cell-to-cell uh, -cell signaling of the yellow-blue axis. Uh, this can be measured in some ways. So if there is a basis uh, to Cuffin's uh, effect, effect on Cuffin's color um, through this, then we know that it might be at that level there. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that we do know that epilepsy influences visual perception in, in various subtle ways. Uh, the story of Judge Watkin Powell um, and the concept that, that Caffeine actually took advantage of this days in advance is an interesting one. 
But the question of colour perception itself, colour rather than just visual perception in general, is, is considerably more controversial. It is measurable using the Farnsworth Munzel 100, 100 Hue test, which is one of the tests that's used to this. It is possible to measure the effect of the medication on uh, color perception. But epilepsy itself doesn't seem to have an effect on color. So the medication may have an effect on color, but epilepsy itself is far less obvious. But from what I've been reading recently, I get the impression that even the medication effect is so minor that in view of the complexity and richness of the processes that we've been talking about, it's unlikely that it played any role any in the physiological role in Cuffin's output. There are so many other aspects um, that he would have taken advantage of. There are so many things to do with visual perception that I haven't touched on in this talk. Shapes have very specific hardwired effects, specific features such as faces, movement, association within the image, two dots close to each other will influence each other. Concepts, for example, red can be is red has associations that shops like McDonald's take advantage of. It's not accidental that Burger King and McDonald's use red in their advertising. It makes people eat more hamburgers. So these things have a very definite effect. Um, the eye is not a camera. It is a highly, highly subjective processing device, uh, all of which goes into producing this. It's a very, very intellectually interesting process. And of course, it's a great deal of what it is to be human. Now, for the artist, it gives a huge amount of variety. For the observer, a huge amount of variety. Plenty of scope for different interactions uh, that have been used over, over the centuries. Now, Cuffin wasn't a physicist, he wasn't a neuroscientist, and yet by talent, by training and skill, he was able to communicate with his audience visually. He could interpret what he saw, and he could pass that on to his audience. Vision itself is one of the most remarkable activities of that most remarkable organ, the human brain. But I really want to emphasize it is an, what we see is totally anthropocentric and it is a very subjective view of the universe. If we widen it out to all the animals, it is subjective, but it clearly works in evolutionary terms. And it's been used for hundreds of millions of years, this process, without much of a change. And what's remarkable is that despite the remarkable conservatism of one single retinal molecule involved and one class of proteins, the opsins, and in fact, the signal transduction pathway that links those to the brain, despite the conservative conservation of that, the variety of expression that we get as humans is remarkable and imagine the whole rest of, 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 of nature, the animal world. Biologists call this biodiversity. I suggest that all the rest of us and all of us call this art. Well, thank you for that. Um, thank you for coming with me on this journey around a little bit of, of Cuffin Williams's brain, possibly. If you are interested, if any of the, th of the parts I've said have interested you, then there is there are further resources on the website, and the, the link is below, including advice um, if you're particularly interested in any of the, the more clinical conditions uh, involved in what I've been speaking about. So thank you very much indeed for your attention, and thanks for your company.